Ben's final thoughts were troubled. Must it be something I did or didn't do? Surely she has a good reason. Why couldn't I have been better for her? A better husband, a better father. I guess it's me. She could never hurt anyone. Growing up in a small town in the Midwest, Ben had what seemed like a pretty perfect life for most everyone around him, everyone but him, of course. Not that he came from a bad family. He really did have a good upbringing. That was me, my name is Ben Davis, by the way. He lived with his mom and dad, and his little sister Amy. The town they lived in, as he mentioned, was really nice, nice people, good schools. Everyone worked hard and got along with each other. His mother worked at the local hardware store, and his father was a machinist at a tool and paint store. They provided everything the family needed, and there were lots of family and friends around. So why was I the only one who couldn't enjoy this beautiful life right outside my door? Ben pondered. Because I lived in my own world most of the time. In his early childhood, Ben was unresponsive to those around him. He was very quiet and had no language skills. He didn't know how to socialize, communicate, or connect with others. As he got a little older, his behavior became very unpredictable. He also had a strange sleep pattern, he didn't have what is now called office hours. Years later, doctors diagnosed him with autism, but in the 1970s when he was a kid, especially in their small town, no one knew about such things. Surprisingly, he had something that other kids like him probably didn't have, a family support system like no other. His parents, as he said, were not doctors or psychiatrists, but they had an innate sense of how to help him. They were very patient with him, took their time, and worked with him every night without interruption. They talked to him about his hidden feelings, how to communicate better, and how to control certain urges. His sister Amy, who was 18 months younger than him, was held back a year so they would be in the same grade. She made sure he was in the right class, had the right book at the ready, and was seated so that he could understand at least what he knew how to do. Amy is very smart. Every night, she would go over the day's work with him to help him cope with his studies. She was very pretty and popular because of this. She socialized with the other kids and, for the most part, kept the bullies away from him, both boys and girls. Without Amy and his mom and dad, Ben probably never would have made it through school and after school, he would never have been able to live on his own. Amy, reflecting on her brother, shared, Some of my friends don't understand why I spend so much time taking care of my brother, Ben. I'll tell you why. My brother is simply the most wonderful person I have ever known. He is the kindest and most loving person in the world. He has never been rude to me or anyone else. He has never said one bad word about anyone. She paused, her voice full of emotion. My parents told me years ago that Ben would need me. They told me to treat it as an honor because Ben is such a good person. Because of his autism, Ben has a very hard time expressing any emotions. But every now and then, maybe only once a year, he gives me a long hug. It's the only way he can express his gratitude and his love for me. Every time he does that, I cry for hours. I know how hard it is for him, and I thank God that I know such a wonderful man. There are some things about my brother that he just doesn't understand. First of all, he's a very handsome guy, about 6 feet tall and 165 pounds he looks a lot like my dad, who is also good looking. Second, he has a pretty high capacity, right now, he can live on his own but he will probably need help paying bills, shopping, and a few other things. Ben, after graduating from high school, got a job with the fire department, thanks to his uncle who had worked there for over 30 years and had a lot of influence. It took him almost a year to get certified. Surprisingly, he passed the physical test pretty well. It was the exams that proved to be very difficult for him. He could learn the material but sitting through a timed exam was very difficult. In high school, teachers would let him take tests separately from his classmates or just give him unlimited time. After he started working, he would make a list of things to do each day. This method helped his brain work better. He just followed his list of instructions every day and worked harder than anyone else, keeping the trucks clean, making sure all the equipment was in perfect working order, and cleaning the station every day. 
All the other firefighters were nice to him, but he never had much to say to anyone. He guessed they liked him because he always pulled more than his share. He worked extra shifts every week if they had family business. On average, he worked about 60 hours a week. He never objected to that, they had families with children, and he had no one. 60 hours a week may seem hard, but he loved his job and made a lot of money. The funny thing is that he spent almost none of it. He bought a used car and eventually moved out of his parents' house and into a small apartment. His mom helped him furnish all four rooms, and his younger sister came over every week to help him pay bills, do a little grocery shopping, or buy clothes, shoes, or anything else she thought he needed. Five years later, he had over $250,000 in his investment account. He was at his little sister's house for a Sunday barbecue when his life changed forever. He was sitting alone in the backyard when the most beautiful girl he had ever seen came up to him to talk. So, you must be Amy's brother, Ben. I've heard so much about you from your little sister. I'm the secretary where we work together. My name is Tony Adams, she introduced herself. I apologize for being so abrupt, but your sister said you are a little shy and don't like to talk much. Ben had never been in this situation before. Sure, he'd hung out with his sister's friends a bit, but never with a strange girl who showed interest in him. And she was beautiful. Oh, I'm glad you came to talk to me. I'm pretty quiet. Would you like to eat with me, and we can spend some time together? Wow, he couldn't believe he managed to utter a few sentences. After that, he let her do the talking, and she really liked to talk. He hardly had to say anything at all. She told him about her life, family, friends, basically everything. Did he mention how great she was? She was perfect. Other than his family, no one had ever made him feel this good about himself. She was beautiful, fun, and sweet, and she seemed to really like him. Amy was so glad she invited Tony to the barbecue. She was the new girl in the office where Amy worked, simple looking, 30 to 40 pounds overweight, but very talkative. Amy thought she might be perfect for her brother, and she was right. Ben didn't need any coaxing. Amy realized he was smitten as soon as they met. She told Tony about her brother's problems and hoped she would treat him well. Tony, reflecting on her relationship with Ben, shared, This guy is great. He's sweet, cute, has a good job, and I can tell he likes me. I've never had a boyfriend before. Sure, I've gone on dates, even let a few guys have sex with me because I wanted to know what sex was like, but never before has a cute guy acted so nice to me or given me so much attention. It's like a dream come true. I'm not gonna let Ben go. This is my chance to have the home and family I've always dreamed of. A year after he met Tony, they got married. It was a small wedding, and his dad was the best man. He'd never made good friends in his life. He just didn't know how to do it. He invited people he worked with at the firehouse, they all came. He thinks they had a good time. Tony invited a lot of friends and family. She is so wonderful and beautiful, he thought. I don't know why she likes me so much, but I try to do my best for her and always try to make her happy. Before they got married, he bought a nice three-bedroom house that she chose. It was in a nice neighborhood. Tony wanted to have extra bedrooms when they had kids. He hoped the kids would be like her and not like him. Amy never thought that when she invited Tony to that party that she would see her 25 years later, still married to her brother and with two children. She seems to be the one who decides everything in their family, and sometimes Amy wishes she was a little more responsive to Ben's needs and wants. But Ben always seems so happy. He still thinks the world begins and ends with Tony. As long as he's happy, I shouldn't complain, should I, she pondered. Tony, however, had her own concerns. I know I shouldn't complain, but I wish Ben wasn't so malleable all the time. Of course, he is. He's always letting me get my way. What woman doesn't want that? She smiled ruefully. He still looks good after 23 years together, a little gray hair, but he stays in good shape through his physically demanding work. We're not rich, but he works overtime every week so I can be a stay-at-home mom. 
He is a good father and has never demanded anything for himself. I guess you could call him average in the bedroom, but that's the price I have to pay for everything else. She paused, reflecting. He was so worried when both our children were born, afraid they would have his problems. But both were born perfectly normal. Simon, the oldest, joined the Navy after high school, and Melissa is a sophomore in college. Thank goodness, Tony continued, I went back to nursing school when the kids went to high school. I would have lost my mind if I didn't have something to do. As usual, Ben was very supportive of her decision. The schooling took two years, and Ben worked tirelessly to pay for it all without tapping into their savings. After school, Tony worked at a local hospital for a few years, then moved on to work for a cardiology group. I like the slower pace of private practice and the close interaction with the doctors and other staff. After working in her new position for a while, Tony realized that all the other women on staff were very fit and attractive, and the doctors, most of whom were men, looked just as good and took care of themselves. This made me think for the first time in my life about how proper diet and exercise could help me. She changed her diet and started exercising. It took her five months, but she lost 33 pounds and also tightened up all over her body. The weight loss made her breasts look huge. For the first time in my life, I started getting a lot of compliments from men, even Ben told me I looked good, but he always says that. She sighed, I guess I don't pay attention to what he says. For the first time in my life, I felt really sexy. Then it was early spring on a Friday morning. Tony was on her way to a new deli that all the guys from the firehouse wanted to try for lunch. It was on the other side of town, about 10 minutes from her job. They took turns picking up lunch, and today was her turn. But that morning, she wasn't thinking about sandwiches, she was thinking about how her wife behaved that morning when she left the house. She usually just says goodbye and sometimes kisses me on the cheek. She used to be a little more affectionate, but for some reason, she stopped showing most of her affection. That morning seemed different. As Tony was leaving and saying goodbye, Ben stopped her at the door, gave her a kiss on the cheek, and a warm hug that lasted a few minutes. Then he simply said goodbye. Admittedly, Tony wasn't good at picking up on people's signs and emotions, so she didn't know why Ben was acting this way. Her thoughts were interrupted when an emergency call came in on her phone that there was a fire at a local elementary school. Their fire station was 10 to 15 minutes away, but she was nearby, just a block away from the school. She was there in a matter of seconds. Tony only had a portable gas mask with her, so she took it out of the trunk and ran to the female administrator she knew. She told Tony that everyone was out, but they couldn't find the third grade teacher and her students. Their classroom was on the second floor of an old three-story building. So Tony took a gas mask and went inside. At first, she couldn't tell where exactly it was burning, it must have been somewhere under the ceiling, but the smoke was everywhere. She had a hard time opening the door to the classroom because the teacher was covered in smoke and lying right outside the door. Ten students huddled in one corner of the room, Tony guessed that some of them were unconscious. Grabbing the teacher by the shoulder, she went outside. As soon as she dropped her off, Tony went back for the students. She picked up two at a time, she didn't know what condition they were in and just grabbed them as fast as she could. She knew she didn't have much time because her portable mask wasn't full when she started, and she felt like she was quickly running out of air. Tony made four runs with the students and tried to get the last two out, a boy and a girl, as she was coming down the hallway for the last trip. Two things happened. First, she ran out of air, and second, the ceiling in the hallway failed. The ceiling tiles and flooring from above started falling down on her. Several heavy objects hit her shoulder and back, but thank God, they didn't hit her head. She had seconds left before she realized she was going to pass out. Her last chance was to grab one of the student desks and ram an old-style window with it. The glass and wood flew in all directions, and she was pretty sure she was covered in blood. She was wearing heavy boots and knocked the safety netting outside the window. Thank God they were old and gave in. She picked up the little girl and held her outside the window with her hands under her arms. There were people downstairs, and she just threw her to them. A few seconds later, she did the same thing to a little boy. That's the last thing she remembered, 
as she must have passed out from the smoke and exhaustion. The next morning, Tony woke up in the hospital. She was told that all the children would be fine, but the teacher was on a tear. Seconds after she threw the boy out, their fire truck pulled up to the school. They put a ladder up to the window through which she was dropping the kids and came in after her. When Tony found out they had risked their lives to save hers, she fell down and cried. No one had ever done anything like that for her. After asking about the kids, the next thing she wanted to know was where was Ben. No one seemed to know where she was. Tony was so scared that something had happened to her. She could have hurt herself for something. Tony was so sad that something had happened to her, and she wasn't there for her. Hundreds of people from their town sent flowers and cards, thanking her for saving those children and the teacher. Some of the children were in the hospital, and all of their families wanted to visit her to wish her well and thank her. She didn't want to see anyone. Tony was so worried and anxious about her wife that she didn't want to talk to anyone. The next day, Sunday, she told the doctors she wanted to go home. They said there was no way she could not go home, in their opinion, because of the physical and emotional stress. It was dangerous for her to leave the hospital. Everyone knew she hadn't heard from her wife, so they thought she shouldn't be alone. But she didn't care, she needed to go home and be near her wife. She needed to be home when her wife needed her. She didn't want to fight with anyone else, so she called a cab and drove home on Sunday afternoon. The house seemed deathly quiet. Something was wrong, something was missing. Tony walked around the house but couldn't figure out what was different. Finally, there it was. On the kitchen table lay an envelope with her name on it. Amy couldn't believe it when the hospital told her Tony had gone home Sunday afternoon. She tried to call her Sunday night, but there was no answer. Amy knew Tony wanted to be left alone, but she needed to check on her. When she arrived Monday morning, the house was locked, and she used her key to get in. What she found inside shook her to her core and broke her heart. Lying on the kitchen floor was her sister, the sweetest person she had ever known. She was barely breathing and completely incoherent. When Amy realized she was breathing and had a pulse, she called 911. While she waited for help, she picked up the letter Tony was holding and read it. Dear Tony, I'm so sorry to break this news to you, but I can't just tell you. I've fallen in love with someone else, one of the doctors in my office. We had been in a physical relationship for months, and I went away with him for the weekend to finally spend time together. Monday night, I'm coming home to get my stuff. I took most of the money out of my account and savings but left you with a house that is paid for. I plan to move in with my lover as soon as possible. I realize now that I probably never really loved you, not the way I love Nigel. He is everything I ever wanted to see in a man. Take care of yourself, and I hope you don't take this too badly. You always wanted me to be happy Tony Amy went to the hospital with Tony. She spent the night there as she felt she should be there. After the doctors were able to assess her poor sister's condition, Amy called both of her children, told them what she had done at school, read them a letter, and finally helped them get home as soon as possible. The doctors immediately told her they were not sure Tony would survive. By mid-afternoon on Monday, they had placed Tony in the intensive care unit of the psychiatric ward. It seemed to Amy that they didn't really understand how to treat Tony. They were a small town with a small hospital, so they didn't know what to do when a case like Tony's came in. So Amy took advantage of what they could answer her and went to Tony's house to wait for her despicable wife. Tony, I guess, turned out to be just plain stupid and naive. She slept with Dr. Nigel Winterburn for two months. The sex was great, and she thought they really had a future. She thought she had fallen in love and found her soulmate. When he asked her to spend a long weekend with him, she thought he felt the same way. He even told her he did. The first day and a half was wonderful. They had sex in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Sunday night, they finally went to a nice restaurant at the resort they went to. After dinner, they went to a club, and there, good old Nigel, the guy she thought was the love of her life, started asking other women to dance. It was humiliating. When she complained about his attitude, 
he told her to try and pick up some guy and sleep in his room at night. She was so angry. She had been played by this A. She had just been used as a sex toy for most of the weekend. The next morning, when he came back, she asked him how he could treat her like that after she left her marriage, and he told her he loved her. He said she was a fool to leave her husband because he would never leave his wife for her. He said he slept with two other women in their office and they didn't get upset or hit on her when she lost weight. He thought she went from fat to curvy and decided to see what she was like in bed. He probably knew that several other doctors wanted to try her. When he was done, now she was going home to see Ben, but how would she ever get back to him, even if he wanted her? He was so weak and simple compared to the other men she worked with every day. All the male doctors were so dynamic and real men, not the ones who needed to be led around by the nose and who no one looks up to. When she got home for dinner Monday night, Ben's car was there, but the house was so quiet, and all the lights were out. Finally, she spotted her sister-in-law Amy sitting in the dark at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee. What's up, Amy, she said. I don't know why you're here, but I'm really tired, so could we meet up later in the week and talk about whatever is on your mind? No, we can't, Tony, Amy replied. So why don't you sit down now, and I'll tell you what's been going on in your life while you've been fooling around. She went on to tell her an incredible story about how Ben heroically rescued 11 people from a burning building, almost died, couldn't figure out where his wife was, drove home from the hospital against doctor's orders, worried about her, and ended up in the hospital after reading her letter. What on earth have I done? Amy asked. I hate to ask this, but would seeing Ben help me? Amy was disgusted with her. You're not going to do any of that. Ben is in a psychiatric ward in isolation right now. He has suffered a severe physical, emotional, and mental breakdown. The doctors are trying to figure out how to treat him. At this point, they have told me that he may never recover. They believe that if you see him, it could trigger another incident that would kill him. Oh, Amy, what have I done? I'll tell you what you've done. You've destroyed the nicest man you've ever known a true hero who wouldn't hesitate to give his life to save others. This man gave you everything when you met and married him. He had neurological issues, it was challenging but not scary. It turned out he was better than everyone else. God gave you the ability to care for this man, to accept his love and everything else he could give you. You had a responsibility to take care of Ben and remember how much you meant to him. He once told me that you were his perfect angel, but what did you do? Not only did you hurt that man, you destroyed his soul. Shame on you, Tony. Epilogue Amy, after the fire, Ben lived for about five more months. Specialists were brought to the hospital to examine him, but there was nothing they could do. They said that the physical and mental trauma of the fire and the emotional devastation of the letter were too much for him to bear. The whole town seemed to come to his funeral. He was a little boy who grew into a man in their small town. He hardly spoke to anyone. Very few people knew him, he hardly ever talked to them, never paid attention to them, but he will always be remembered as the greatest hero their town has ever known. He literally walked into hell to save those innocent children. Amy wondered how many families would have been destroyed if it wasn't for her brother. Because of her betrayal, Tony was universally ostracized. Her children never forgave her, nor did the rest of the town. She sold her house, gave the money to her children, and soon left town. Amy had no idea where she is now, but she left a broken woman. Ben's children are doing well. His son Simon Davis is still in the Navy, and his daughter Melissa graduated and now lives and works in their town. Dr. Nigel will not be returning as he too has been driven out of town. His wife divorced him, took him to the cleaners, and the doctors in his group got rid of him, and he ended up leaving for parts unknown. Amy thinks about Ben every day. Why he had to love his woman so purely, to see nothing wrong, she will never know the answer to that question, but she does know one thing, the world is a much better place because of this wonderful man.